Welcome everyone. I'm Paul Herman with CCLI. Today I get to talk to Eddie DeGarmo, former president of Capital Christian Music Publishing, founder of Forefront Records, keyboardist for DeGarmo and Key Band, and now most recently an author. Eddie, so good to have you here. Great to be here, Paul. Thank you. So let's talk about your book, um, Rebel for God. You brought a copy. It's really your life in the Christian music industry. And you, you talk about it from a whole lot of different angles, you know, musician and singer and songwriter and producer, um, record label exec, publishing exec. You've seen it all. Well, the problem with that is I'm still trying to figure out what I want to be when I grow up. <laughs> That's the real problem. Uh, when I first started writing this book three and a half years ago, I really wanted to just chronicle, chronicle my journey along with my wife's because we've had a pretty miraculous journey, I think. Uh, I think I'm, I'm, I'm probably one of the few guys, uh, you know, I started out early in Christian music. Uh, Susan and I had a, had a pretty hard time. I had been in an accident. I hurt my back and I was laid up in a hospital for a long period of time. They didn't know if I was gonna walk again. Mm. And we lost everything we had and I was on government assistance, yeah. food stamps, mm. and welfare and all that wow. stuff. And so uh, that was a catalyst for me to really want to take notice of what God had planned for my life. Yeah. And so that's when we started the band back and I went from the band to the record label side of things to the music publisher mm -hmm. side, because those are two different things. Right. And uh, so I've, I've had the, uh, I think, luxury in my journey to do a lot of different things. Yeah. So it's, it's been quite a journey. Right. So you grew up in the music scene in yeah. Memphis. Yeah. And I've always wondered, uh, I love that Mark Cohn song, Walking ah. in Memphis. Now, does that ring true for you? Sort of true. He yeah. talks about catfish. Right. I mean, honestly, if you're from Memphis, you got to talk about barbecue, man. <laughs> so <laughs> that's the only thing. Yeah. I take a task with a little bit. Right. But you yeah. know, when I, when I was a kid in Memphis, it was music was everywhere. It was on every street corner. Of course, we had Elvis Presley, yeah. and you know, and we had Stax Records with artists like Otis Redding and Wilson Pickett and Sam and Dave yeah. and. You know, music was everywhere. So I started playing in a dance band when I was 10 years old. Right. You know, and uh, interesting for me, in those days, Christians didn't dance mm -hmm. in church. Yeah. And so that became a little bit of a dividing point for me, right. you know, early on in my faith. Mm -hmm. And so I, I stopped going to church during my teenage years and, and my family did too. It was the 60s and <laughs> Our band was every part mm -hmm. of the '60s, good or bad, yeah. you know, and so it was free form, right? Counterculture revolution, we called it. Yeah. And so I got in a, I got in a heap of trouble that most <laughs> teenagers get into, and you know, thankfully God saved me when I was almost 18. Yeah. And uh, my my trek into Christian music was truly a Forrest Gump, uh, meaning I didn't know what I was doing, I didn't try mm -hmm. to do it necessarily. It was just the, the Lord had saved me. I went back to school the next day, told my friend, my friend since the first grade, Dana Key about it. He came to Christ. Mm. And over the course of the next few months, we just started writing songs that reflected our faith. Yeah. Didn't know anything about the Christian music industry, never realized that, mm -hmm. I, that anybody could ever make a living, you know, yeah. playing Christian music. That really wasn't why we did it. We just knew that music, was a magnet that mm -hmm. could draw a crowd together yeah. and we wanted to share with them our faith. Yeah. And so that's where we began. And oh my gosh, did we get in a lot of trouble. <laughs> well, we tried doing that in clubs and bars at first mm -hmm. and I figured out early on, you gotta be a real man if you're gonna talk about Jesus standing on a nightclub stage. Yeah, you know? right. And uh, you know, I've had many artists come to me through the years and say, well, you know, we feel like that's where we want to be. And I said, I don't argue with that point, but mm -hmm. sometimes I think if you're looking to share the gospel, you might do better on a bar stool sitting next yeah. to somebody than you would from a platform. That's just my feeling, yeah. having done it. Right. And yeah. uh, so then we, then we tried something that we thought made sense, and it was 1972, is we tried playing Christian rock music in churches. Right. And that was even worse. <laughs> <laughs> that yeah, was, was even I worse. I was going to ask you about oh that. Oh, my I mean, gosh. Eddie, I was, I was amazed at the scrutiny and the criticism that you got pretty much all the way through. 
Well, there was a time where I, I guess I was probably uh, hurt by some of that mm -hmm. and, you know, felt very misunderstood and all that sort of thing. And then as time went on, I think I got fairly oh, thick skinned about all that mm -hmm. because I felt like that, that we had been called to be subcultural missionaries, if you will. Yeah. That's the way we viewed ourselves mm -hmm. and felt like that it was important to take the message of, of Christ to places that that other people at that time weren't necessarily doing the same way. Mm -hmm. you know, a lot of people do that now. And so the criticism, however, became a very positive thing because maybe it's kind of like driving down the freeway and seeing a wreck on the side of the road. Mm -hmm. You right. can't help but notice, <laughs> right. you know. And so all the newspaper guys and radio guys and media guys wanted to talk about it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so it really, oh, I began to popularize what we did. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I also love the detail that you shared about your conversion, you know, uh, and the epiphanies that surrounded that. Can yeah. you talk a little bit about that? Well, sure, sure I can. Um, it was during the Vietnam War and uh, my older brother was in the military and he came home from the military a very different kind of person, yeah. uh, and not a good way. Yeah. He was just, man, he was a wild dog, best way I know how to say it. He went out and bought a big motorcycle and started riding with a motorcycle gang. And we just kind of came from normal, you know, middle-class America, and so right. that wasn't our particular tribe, yeah. if you will. Yeah. And I was concerned about him, but at the same time I was concerned about him, I was like living in my own dark reality of playing in rock bands and doing all that sort of thing. But I was worried about him. And then one night I came home late at night after playing a dance somewhere and got home two or three in the morning. And my brother was sitting at the dining room table and on one side of the table, he had a bottle of Jack Daniels whiskey and on the other side of the table, he had a Bible. Mm -hmm. And he was just looking at it. Wow. And I just asked him, I said, what has happened? He said, Eddie, I gotta share something with you. He said. When I was in the service and I was in Germany, he said, I, I went to a Bible study one night and I heard about how you could have a personal walk with Jesus. And I committed my life to Jesus in Germany. And when I got home, he said, I was just afraid to tell you about it. Mm. And so I went to this other path yeah. and he said, but God won't let me go. Mm. Which is a pretty cool story, yeah. but it freaked me out. <clears throat> freaked me out big time. And I thought, oh, that sounds pretty exciting, Larry. Let's go to bed. Yeah. You know? So over the course of the next few months, he began to tell me more and more and share with me more and more about his faith and actually started driving me crazy with mm. it. And we shared a room. I was a senior in high school, about to graduate. And uh, one night he, he said, Eddie, he said, I got to talk to you about Jesus. This is a real thing. And you've got to make a decision. And I'm like, what are you talking about? Mm -hmm. I go to a Baptist church. I, yeah. You know, I'm I'm all, I'm American. Right. You know? <laughs> so he said, no, it's more than that. He said, you need to make a decision whether you're going to dedicate your life to him or not. And I remember just getting really angry with him and telling him, shut up, leave me alone. And so he did. But then when the silence hit, when the lights turned off, I remember a simple prayer that I prayed to God. God, either he's right or I'm right. Mm -hmm. And I want you to show me which one. Ooh. Yeah, you got to watch that one. <laughs> <laughs> so over the course of the next three months, you know, uh, God began to reveal things to me and, and uh, I joined my brother and I went to church service and that morning I'd never seen anybody play guitar in church mm. and there was an artist playing named Dallas Holm. I remember, yeah. Playing in that church. And uh, later that afternoon, I, I went out to a, a park in central Memphis that had all the rock bands and the hippies and the frisbees and I saw my friends out there, you know, partying. Yeah. And it was really, my eyes were open for the first time, mm -hmm. I think. And I just said, well, that's what I am. And this over here, that's what God really wants me to do. Yeah. And so that was heavy. And I went back to, to church that night with my brother. Uh, a preacher was preaching named David Wilkerson. Oh, yes. Mr. Wilkerson. Mm -hmm. uh, Interesting thing about Mr. Wilkerson later in his career, he actually wrote some funny things about me. But I that, remember <laughs> that night he was preaching the gospel. Yes, and mm -hmm. uh, I came to Christ. And interesting, I wasn't I wasn't happy about it. Mm. And I know that sounds really weird, but I wasn't. Yeah, I was like, mm -hmm. uh, 
man, I'm gonna have to quit my band. I've given my whole life to this thing, yeah. you know, and now God's mess, messed it up. Mm. And so I went home and I, I wasn't an emotional guy, but I, I went home and I remember like, you know, weeping in my bedroom. Mm -hmm. God, you what have I done? <laughs> I, I've screwed my life up, oh, you know. Goodness. And he had mercy on me, thankfully. Yeah. And I woke up the next morning. Um, and then the next day, I think it was, you shared with Dana. I did. I went back to school. Uh, I remember this as clear as a bell, and I saw Dana walking down the hallway. We had known each other our whole lives, played bands together. Yeah. A lot of times dated the same girls, you know, <laughs> it was all that. We were, we were like brothers. And I, I said to him, Dana, you're not gonna believe what happened to me. Yesterday, I found Jesus. Mm -hmm. And he looked right back at me and he goes, hey man, I didn't know he was missing. <laughs> That's exactly what he said. He could always be a smart aleck. Yeah. So, and then I said something that was pretty remarkable. I mean, God's grace is big, right? Mm -hmm. I said, well, hey, you know, let's skip school. I wanna tell you about it. <laughs> <laughs> so we skipped school and I, I started, I had a Bible and I just started reading. I said, you gotta know about this. And I didn't know anything about the Bible. Mm -hmm. I, I might've been reading Leviticus, I don't know, but I just opened yeah. it up and started reading <laughs> it, you know? And uh, over the course of the next hour, he just was like, you know, he said, you're right. He said, I've just mm -hmm. been going through the same stuff. And he said, I, I feel empty and I, I'm, you're obviously really excited about all this and I, I wanna know more. And so we prayed together and, and he received Christ. I was skipping school that <laughs> And then you started writing Christian music. We did. And I understand then that one of your first fans or your first groupies, as, as you said, was uh, the lady that would be your my, wife. My lovely wife, Susan. We, we were the crazy age of 18 when we first <laughs> met. And we couldn't find any place to play after the clubs threw us out and after yeah. the churches threw us out. So there was an, an, a recording studio in downtown Memphis, kind of, in the ghetto, mm -hmm. in a rough part of town. But this man used to be our manager when we were in the rock band, and he saw something that was intriguing to him with us and mm -hmm. how dedicated we were to this. Yeah. This was over a period of months, because we, we left our mainstream band and we were, we were assigned band to a major label. Mm -hmm. And that was a big deal for a teenager to walk away from yeah. that, you know. And so he would let us rehearse at the recording studio. Mm -hmm. And it was across the street from an African-American church. And they would hear us, the bass thumping through the walls. Right. And mm -hmm. they would want to come over and sing yeah. with us, <laughs> you know, which was really cool. Yeah. And then the kids around town begin to hear about us. Mm -hmm. Hey, there's a Christian group and they rehearse or they play in this old it was like a converted furniture store. It was a big open space yeah. and it had been made into a studio. So it was all soundproofed and carpeted and all that stuff. And so the kids started coming around to hear the Christian band. And one night our guitar player, not Dana, but our other guitar player brought this girl from his neighborhood named Susan. Mm -hmm. And that was how I met my wife. She said I was completely stuck up and wouldn't <laughs> talk to her all night. But over the course of the next, you know, month or two yeah. we got to know each other and she became a believer that night and I, I think Susan and I were talking about this just this morning and I think she was probably the first person to come to Christ as a result of our music. Wow. So it was kind of cool. She'd been with me 45 years. Mm. She says it's really only 22 because <laughs> I was gone the first half. <clears throat> so yeah. With how hard it was though, I mean, through all of those years, I I'm sure you must have had some conversations of it. Man, is this worth it? Of course. Yeah. Of course. And I remember telling her dad, he asked me when, I, when we went and sat and told him I was get, we were gonna get married. Mm -hmm. He said, well, how are you gonna support my daughter? You know, <laughs> yeah. good question, right? The dad talk. Yeah, the dad uh -huh. talk. And I'm like, I'm gonna play in a Jesus rock band. <laughs> <laughs> and I remember it was like all the air left the room, you know, and he just looked back at me and he goes, what's that, you know? And so we, we were off on this mission together and Susan, uh, I owe her a lot because, you know, without her support, especially, you know, we started having children pretty quickly after we were married. Susan says it was like nine months and 15 minutes, you know? <laughs> It might have been more like <laughs> nine months and five minutes, I don't wow. know. But it was quick, yeah. Right? And so 
uh, when we started De Carmel and Key with Pat Boone signing us and Mike Curb signing us to their label, uh, we had two little girls. Mm. One that was a newborn yeah. and one that was uh, two and a half. Mm -hmm. So we, we got down and prayed about, you know, God, what should we do with this? Yeah. We have to support our family, but at the same time, we know we're supposed to do this. Right. And we came up with what I think is kind of an important thing. We said, you know, we're going to, for our number was four years. We're going to give this four years. Mm. And whatever it takes, if I have to paint houses in the middle of the night, if I have to mow lawns, you know, if you have to do babysitting or whatever, yeah. whatever it takes, let's give it everything we got for four years. Mm. And at the end of four years, we'll take another look at it. And it took just about every second of it. Wow you know, before we were able to eke out enough to get off of all of the government stuff that, because right. I had the back injury and all that stuff. Yes. Mm -hmm. So, but it, you know, God had a plan, right. worked out. I also love all of the insight that you wrote about um, concerning your relationship with Dana. Oh um, my gosh. There's a lot to tell. Well, we were, you know, Dana and I, um, funny thing, funny story, is that in our rock bands growing up, neither one of us ever sang. Mm. We always had other okay. people that mm -hmm. did the singing. Yeah. And the only time that we started singing was when we first became Christians <laughs> because we couldn't find another singer. <laughs> right. <laughs> and so somebody had to sing. Yeah. So he started singing. And, you know, he's going to be laughing from heaven when he hears this. You know, okay, Dana, finally, you're a better singer than me. But, but I'm okay. But, uh, you know, we, we, we had opposing gifts in a way. Mm -hmm. He... He really was more of the pastoral mind, and I was more of the business mind. Yeah. You know, both of us were creative. Mm -hmm. uh, we both contributed to the songs, and we wrote all of our songs together, you know, either either all together or one of us would bring the other one a, a big chunk of it and the yeah. other one finish. So we were both on the creative side, both produced our records. I was always the guy that was trying to figure out how to buy another tank of gas to get mm -hmm. to the next town. Right. You know, I was the guy that went to him, you know, and said, I think we, you know, the rock band sell t-shirts. Can't we sell a t-shirt? And he, he was the guy that said, we can't sell a t-shirt with our name on it. That's like totally carnal. Uh, we can't do that. And I'm like, I don't know. Let's print some up and see what happens. <laughs> right. And so, you know, maybe I'm the lesser, but I, I was always that guy. And maybe that's what lent me into going into the record business and, to mm -hmm. the, you know, working with artists and songwriters and all that sort of thing. Because yeah. he, you know, after we retired in 94, he did what was totally normal for him as he pastored a church. Because mm -hmm. that's, you know, what he felt like that yeah. God had called him to be. Yeah. So. You also wrote in the book uh, a lot about the toll that the business takes on relationships. And, uh, right. I, mean, I thought that was powerful. Well, uh, some of that stuff's difficult to write about because yeah. you, you know, when you form businesses, everybody has a different version of what their expectations are. Mm -hmm. You know, and I've always, I've always been a guy that, of all the businesses that I've formed, or ran, or managed for somebody. I always want somebody better than me mm. that I'm a partner with, mm -hmm. you know, and when I managed capital and I had all those employees, their publishing business, you know, I always felt like that if other people weren't having conversations with my staff yeah. about, hey, you should come work with me, that maybe I didn't have the, mm, the, 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 the right, right people, yeah. you know, yeah. and so that never intimidated me, and so when I started Forefront, I had some very, very... Uh, influential people helped me start it and uh, you know over a period of time you get a different feel for what someone wants or the, they expect and mm -hmm. it can create tensions right not all bad yeah and I did write about some of those painful things mm -hmm. and some of the toll that it did have on friendship relationships right. not necessarily on being brothers mm -hmm. but you know yeah. where we felt like well you know I, I think everybody probably has people in their life that, that they say, hey, I just, let's wait and see each other in heaven. <laughs> <laughs> I think we all have those. Yes, I know so, what you're saying. Yeah. yeah. But halfway through the book, you asked an interesting question. Uh, you, you asked, or you wondered, I think, you know, what's God's favorite music? 
Um, that's any, any further thoughts on that? Well, that's some deep water. <laughs> that's some really deep water because, you know, uh, taste has a lot to do with that, and I think culture has a lot to do with that. Yeah. You know, there's the Western scale is what's very popular in the world today, but it's not always been that way. I mm -hmm. mean, there is an Eastern scale, and there's right. an Indian scale, and there's, yeah. you know, and some of those scales are not pleasing to our ear because mm -hmm. of what we were raised on, but yeah. they are pleasing to those other ears. Yeah. And then, you know, you have many of the masters that created instrumental music. Mm -hmm. And I've heard people say, well, if the words don't glorify God, you know, it can't be, it can't be any good. And that's kind of a loaded question a little bit, right. but, or a thought, but then what do you do with instrumental music? Mm -hmm. You know, what if it has no words? Yeah. It, I mean, maybe all of it should be thrown away. <laughs> and so when you start unpacking that question, does God like country music better than he likes pop? Does he like, you know, modern worship music better than he likes contemporary Christian music? Does he like Eastern scale better than he does Western scale? Uh, for for those of us that have been blessed enough to travel around the world, you know, I've heard every culture do different kinds of sounding music, mm -hmm. even to some of the songs that I know. Yeah. You know, I've been in Africa and, and heard groups sing a worship song mm -hmm. and it sounds totally different. Yeah. You know? The only thing you might recognize is one phrase. Yeah. You know. So um, it's it's kind of like you know, which who this which God? <laughs> I mean, not which God. I didn't mean that, but it's like you know, which person does God think is more beautiful? Mm, yeah. Right. Well, for yeah. me though, I I think like that whatever music is his favorite, it's got to have a Hammond B three. Oh so. <laughs> well. <laughs> There's nothing wrong with a B3. I, I couldn't find anything wrong with that. You can like lay your arm across that's it right, and it yeah. sounds pretty I've good. I've heard that that's what invites the Holy Spirit <laughs> in, you know, so. <laughs> well, it's, so, but I think, you know, the music question is such a relevant question because mm -hmm. it's, it's caused some great unity in the church and yeah. it's also caused some great division. Mm -hmm. I just finished a bio on Martin Luther. And, you know, most historians credit Martin Luther for congregational singing mm -hmm. in the church. Right. Because before him, the singing was really much relegated to the officials of the church. Right. Mm -hmm. And then he wrote some of the very first hymns, yeah. even borrowed some of the tunes from old bar songs and mm -hmm. stuff, you know, and where the congregation yeah. sang. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, what did people do for 1,500 years before that? Right. You know, they didn't, they couldn't sound like you too. Yeah. <laughs> and that's another interesting part of your story because when you founded Forefront Records, uh, you found artists that were different than you guys. Tried to, yes. Um, and I um, mean, what came from that is, is amazing. Well, that's a, that's a branding idea. You know, um, we, we really felt like that at that time, it was 1987, 1988, that we wanted to find a Christian group that did rap music, mm -hmm. you know, that did hip hop music. And it wasn't very acceptable by yeah. the church at that point. Uh, but it was, it was an art form that was growing in the mainstream and mm -hmm. a lot of kids were drawn to it. Yeah. And we felt like if we could find somebody that was doing that from a Christian perspective, that it, it could take hold if it was done well. Mm -hmm. And thus we signed DC Talk, yeah. you know, and, uh, I've been asked the question a thousand times, well, how did you get to sign DC Talk? And the answer is pretty simple, because nobody else would. Mm. And uh, they were passed on by every major label out there, because yeah. they were all afraid of that mm -hmm. genre of music. And we were, we were not afraid of it more than that. We wanted to dive into it, yeah. because we felt like it was the future. Mm -hmm. And Forefront was started in 87, and over a 10 year span, it just, blew out our expectations of what success could look like. Mm -hmm. And as, as much success from a business point of view that I had as an artist, I had 10 times the success as a, as a label person mm -hmm. working with DC Talk and Audio Adrenaline and Stacey Arico and Rebecca St. James and Skillet and Jeff Moore in the Distance yeah. and Small Town Poets and Big Tent Revival and Code of Ethics and you know the list goes on and mm -hmm. on. And I was very blessed, uh, I think, uh, probably even even more so that where I was able to move from my artist career. And I kind of viewed myself as, say, if I played in the NFL or something, I became the coach. Mm. 
you know, mm -hmm. and uh, it was very natural for me to yeah. do that. Mm -hmm. Towards the end of the book, you mention that a lot of ministries become shiny and polished. Oh, yeah. And I thought that was a great concept. <laughs> Can you talk more about that? Sure. That's <clears throat> When I was a kid, my dad was a huge fan of Southern gospel music. Mm -hmm. And, you know, people ask me a lot of times, what kind of music did you get influenced by early? And it was certainly the rock bands, you know, the Beatles and the Rolling Stones and Elvis and all that stuff. But my dad would literally drag me to these all-night singings mm -hmm. in, in, in Memphis at the Southern Gospel Quartet Convention. Yeah. And these guys always had the sharpest suits, <laughs> they had the sharpest hairdos, <laughs> and they had the shiniest buses that money could buy. <laughs> right. So when I became a Christian and started really wanting to seek God, I made a commitment to myself that I wasn't going to get trapped by those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. well, I'm not gonna get me a shiny suit. I'm not gonna get me yeah. a shiny bus. Yeah. And then one day, I was, I remember the day, mm -hmm. I was playing at a festival uh, up in Kentucky called Ichthus, and there was a mirror backstage, and I walked in front of the mirror and I was wearing the shiny suit. <laughs> and I was like, what has happened to me? Wow. You know, and you know, then the inspirational artist came along in the late 70s and early 80s, and there was a big movement in church to take music back into Sunday morning. And mm -hmm. you, you had wonderful artists like Sandy Patty and Wayne Watson and Steve Green and, yeah. you know, and they kind of made the same commitment. Well, we're not gonna chase the glitz of rock and roll and we're not gonna have shiny suits, you know, mm -hmm. and we're gonna take music back to the church. And then success crept in mm -hmm. a couple of years go by and all of a sudden, they look at their bus and they're like, it's a shiny bus, <laughs> Yeah, you know? And it went on from that to the grunge movement of the early 90s and even the grunge movement, you know, that spawned groups that, that I worked with and groups like Jars of Clay and that, you know, very successful artists that were kind of the anti-material view of the day. Right. But by the same token, they all, wore their version of shiny, shiny flannel, <laughs> yeah. you know, and, and traveled in shiny buses. Then the worship guys came along and worship girls and they said, you know what, we're tired of no music to the church. We're going to bring it back in the church mm -hmm. and we're going to write songs yeah. to God, yeah. which is awesome. Right. Right. And so, you know, late eighties, you know, labels like Miranatha and Integrity and, and then the nineties, you know, labels like Kingsway and Thank You Music and, you know, got involved in working with songwriters and artists that were writing songs with a vertical lyric to God. Right. Now that was before we had, and this next term probably will freak a few people out. <laughs> that was before we had what we've known now as like worship celebrities, yeah. you know. And I'm not, I'm not being disrespectful. I'm just saying when success creeps in to anything like that, it's very easy to get taken by it. Mm -hmm. And it's very easy to forget what your initial mission was about. Yeah. You know, and I just encourage us all. I put myself in this same, same hat, mm -hmm. you know, that success is not measured God, in God's eyes the way that that the world measures success. Mm -hmm. It's not it's not about your chart position on CCLI. Yeah. You know, it's it's not about how many people come to your events or your concerts or that. You know, success in God's eyes, I really believe is about being faithful. Mm -hmm. It's about, you know, loving him, it's about loving your neighbor. Yeah. You know, it's about being kind, it's about, you know, sharing Christ with the world. Mm -hmm. And it's not about number of baptisms or number of tickets or number of downloads. Those things are not bad in themselves, but those are business things. Right. Yeah. You know, those those are not ministry things. Right. Those are business things. Yeah. And and I was in the business of Christian music for fifty years. Mm -hmm. And I would tell artists when they would come and we would meet together or songwriters, I would say, look, your job is to create art that brings people closer to God. Yeah. My job is to make sure you can do it next week and next year <laughs> and the year after. Yes. So let me think about that side of mm -hmm. it. You guys at CCLI help help with that a lot, you know, in, in the way that you monitor music and, you know, are able to help sustain writers yeah. 
you know, through that. And so, but that that's the business of music. Mm -hmm. And it's easy to get distracted in the business of music different than what our calling is. Yeah. Yes, it is. Does that make sense? Uh, it does. Yeah. It absolutely does. And, and again, I mean, you honored us and you honored CCLI in the book, and we thank you for that. But it really is all for a higher purpose. And, and I was going to ask you, actually, in, in all your years in the Christian music business, I understand that you just recently uh, led worship for the first time. Yes, that's a little bit embarrassing, <laughs> you know. But, well, first of all, let me slough it off a little bit. In, in my days of being a recording artist and a concert performing artist, you know, we didn't have people leading worship the same way. Yeah. We had music ministers that right. did mm -hmm. this thing, yes. <laughs> you yes. know what I mean? Right. And uh, <clears throat> so I didn't grow up in that mm -hmm. kind of art form, if you will. And yeah. so when I started working with worship writers and worship artists in the late 90s, and then was asked to, to run what is now Capital, it used to be EMI, uh, you know, and was put into the mixer with these incredible songwriters like Stuart Townend and, and Keith Getty and, you know, and Matt Redman and Chris Tomlin and Jonas Myron and, you know, Martin Smith. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, all of a sudden I felt like I was like, you know, playing on the 29 Yankees or something because I, I had all these guys that yeah. were at the top of their top of their uh, art form in mm -hmm. writing worship music yeah. you know I felt like that it was really important for me to learn what worked for them mm -hmm. and the wonderful thing about worship music from a business perspective because there's something wonderful uh, from that point of view worship leaders because many of them are bivocational and will lead a church mm -hmm. often the church becomes a way for them to test market their material, mm -hmm. you know? Right. And they learn what works and yes. learn what doesn't work. And so I just never focused on doing that myself. Mm -hmm. I always focused on helping others learning how to do that, you know, through our programs like worshiptogether.com at yeah. Capital and through, you know, collaboration, collaboration, putting Matt Meyer with Chris Tomlin you know, and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And so my church, passed, my pastor came to me about two months ago and he says, Eddie, I got this idea. I said, what is it? He goes, how about you leave worship? <laughs> and I was like, oh my gosh, I was like a deer in headlights. <laughs> I was like, what? <laughs> he said, yeah, he said, how much? He said, I'd like for you to leave worship. You need to, you, you need to lead worship. And I said, well, I said, pastor, I've never done that. <laughs> And uh, he said to me almost the same words that Bill Hearn said to me when he hired me to be president of VMI Christian Music Publishing. And we were talking about worship music. And I said, well, Bill, I said, I don't know a lot about worship music. And he said, you'll do fine. <laughs> and my pastor said to me, you'll do fine. <laughs> and so I took it seriously. And I went home and I learned a lot of the songs that I had worked with for years. Mm -hmm. You know, and the awesome thing with resources like what you have at CCLI and what they had at Worship Together, which I helped do a lot <laughs> of that, I was able to, you know, at least learn these songs yeah. and, and lead the congregation. So and now they've asked me to do it again. So <laughs> I guess I passed the audition. Oh, nice. You know? Nice. So as you look back on it all, any final thoughts at all? Well, I just encourage. You know, from, from a creative perspective, I encourage people to, to uh, if they feel drawn to be in the music or even the visual arts or whatever, you know, use your gift to serve, serve the Lord, yeah. you know. And that can mean a lot of different things. It doesn't mean that you always have to paint pictures of Jesus on the cross. Mm -hmm. You know, that's a good picture, right. but you know, we live in a big world. Yeah. And if you're a musical artist, you know, if you write uh, Christian music, you have a wealth of information to draw on with the Bible. It's just do things that draw people closer to Christ than push them away. Yeah. And it can literally be a song about a boy falling in love with a girl. I mean, it really can be. Yeah. You know, those things are biblical too. Yes. <laughs> right? Indeed. So, 
you know, let's, let's use our art not to push people away from the gospel. Yeah. A strong close. And the other thing I would say, because I think this is important as a creative person, you know, don't use money as an end game to do what you're called to do. Because mm. sometimes your calling will have success in the world's eyes, and then sometimes success comes differently. You know, there's been a lot of great missionaries that have never had, you know, a pillow to put their head on mm -hmm. and have been some of the most successful people on the planet. Yeah. And I've known, my gosh, I've known people that could, you know, stack a skyscraper full of money mm -hmm. that are the unhappiest people yeah. on the planet. Yeah. So. Wow. Eddie, this has been wonderful. Thank you for sharing with us. And thank you for writing the book. I'm excited that your story is going to get out there. So appreciate it all. Thank you for watching. Take care.